Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Denning. I'm chair of Gretchen's uh, National, uh, Natural Capital Advisory Council. And uh, it's my honor and privilege to welcome all of you to Stanford, to the San Francisco Bay Area, to California, where occasionally it rains, um, and to our esteemed colleagues from around the world and our special delegation from China, a special welcome to the United States. And to all of you, a warm welcome to the Natural Capital Project's annual dinner. Go ahead and start eating. Uh, Gretchen's got a full program tonight, and so we have to, we have to uh, dual, dual, dual load here. So uh, <laughs> let me say that the world is awash in truly transformational change facing disruption in many areas and along many dimensions. From the artificial intelligence-driven digital era to massive demographic changes in Asia, from the rise of cities and the reshaping of the urban landscape to the life-changing biological revolution to the life-altering impacts of climate and other environmental changes on our planet Earth. These broad forces will dramatically transform our ecosystems, our economy, and our society, changing forever how we work, live, and play. We are all here tonight because of our mutual concern about the adverse aspects of climate change and the loss of natural capital. Earth's lands, water, and biodiversity. Many organizations cite the impacts and, dim and dimensions of the challenges of climate change, but few, very few, pose a more proactive, positive, and profound means of addressing it head on than the Natural Capital Project. NETCAP represent, represents what many believe is a means of measuring, monitoring, and mitigating the world's most pressing environmental problems. Mary Ruckelshaus, Managing Director at NETCAP and Gretchen's co-pilot, describes the Natural Capital Project as, quote, a fundamental shift in the way people think about nature, and human well-being. It is our great privilege and honor to host this evening a group so dedicated to this fundamental shift. You are a group leading a revolution about how we think about the value of natural capital and how we work to incorporate the value into the global resource allocation decision making framework. This revolution will result in a radical revision in how we maintain sustainable economic growth and viable environmental stewardship. Or as Gretchen describes it, by valuing and integrating nature, quote, we can create the smarter practices, policies, and institutions needed to live together on this planet harmoniously. At this year's NatCat, NatCat Symposium, there are over 350 participants from 35 different countries, with about half focused in research and the other half in implementation. Within this group is a special high-level delegation from the Chinese Academy of Sciences that is representative of China's global leadership in the inclusion of natural capital into their resource allocation decision-making framework and their commitment to pursuing a green economic growth policy. Together we, that is Stanford University, the Woods Institute, and NETCAP, aim to accelerate innovation in how we value natural capital to deepen our understanding of the interdisciplinary science that underpins natural capital, 
and to develop policies that incorporate the value of natural capital and ecosystem services into our financial and economic decision-making frameworks. By doing so, Stanford embodies its core mission and its responsibility. Going back to our founders, Leland and Jane Stanford, of being a, quote, purposeful university. Our new president, Mark Tessier Levine, describes a purposeful university as one that promotes and celebrates excellence as a means to magnify its benefit to society. NetCap's impact and its benefit to society have been derived from its collaborative partnerships, which is something we envision drawing on even more as we move into the implement implementation and scaling phases ahead. Accordingly, I would like to use this opportunity this evening to call on the leaders of our core partners to stand and to say a few, few words about those partnerships. First, Jessica Hellman. Jessica, where are you? Right here. <laughs> Jessica's from the University of Minnesota Institute on the Environment. Jessica. Good evening. Let's make sure this works. Working perfectly. Wonderful. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm here. My name is Jessica Hellman. I'm here to say hello to all of you on behalf of faculty, um, researchers, and students at the University of Minnesota in our institute who greatly admire and benefit tremendously from the opportunity to interact with the Natural Capital Project at the University of Minnesota. Uh, our institute is dedicated, we say, to leading the future, leading the construction, building a future where people and planet prosper together. And that is one of the reasons why the NatCap project is a flagship project for us, because there, it's hard to imagine too many other examples that so well embody the concept of people and planet prospering together. You heard this afternoon at least a couple of shout outs to uh, NatCap scientists at the University of Minnesota and some of the work that we're doing. And we are thrilled to, we talked about mission of Stanford University, University of Minnesota brings a land grant mission which is dedicated to the, was initially created to serve the public good. And that is again really well represented in our NatCap project. We are thrilled to be, to welcome the Chinese Academy of Sciences to the project as well as formal partners. And the Institute on the Environment is extraordinarily excited about this new scaling and implementation phase, and we are all in. So, thank you. Thank Steve. you, Jessica. Now let's turn to Nick Sequin, Chief Conservation Officer, World Wildlife Fund. Thank you very much. On behalf of WWF, um, to say we're so excited to be part of this partnership. The challenges that we confront today are so gargantuan that no single agency, in our case network, um, can address them working all alone. This partnership gives us an opportunity, working together, to make a real difference. Let's not forget, and today, sadly, we lost Sudan, the last male northern white rhino. Let's not forget um, that biodiversity is under severe threat. We face trade-offs on a daily basis, and the trade-offs, sadly, are um, contra to our conservation aims. The Natural Capital Project provides us with the means of generating information, looking at environmental values, helping to bring those values to the table in the cost-benefit calculus um, of decision that underpins decision-making with economic and social values, in order to ensure that we find the right balance. Otherwise, the world, and I come from the United Nations, where in my previous job, I was the Director for Sustainable Development. We presided over the launch of the Sustainable Development Agenda and the SDGs. So speaking from that perspective, I have to say that notwithstanding an agreement globally to try and pursue development that really and truly is built on three pillars, economic, social, and environmental, 
Still today, we focus on the economic, and then the social, and environmental comes a distant third. And so through this partnership, we at WWF, um, and we're looking forward to growing the partnership, and there are new challenges out there that we need to, we need to, we need to build in order to ensure that we're fit for purpose. Um, but we at WWF are excited to be part of this initiative, and hopefully through it, to make the difference that we all need. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And next, uh, my colleague, good friend, Mark Tursik, CEO of the Nature Conservancy. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. I uh, this event every year. Uh, my colleagues and I at the Nature Conservancy love being part of NatCap. Thanks to everybody at Stanford for hosting the event. Thanks, Stanford, Minnesota, WWF, and now the Chinese Academy of Sciences for being such great partners. Um, to be sure, all of us conservationists, um, we have to be, you know, realistic based, real, reality based. We face some daunting challenges. Today, I got to give a, a talk to the, at the symposium focusing on the financing challenges we face, and indeed they are huge. But there's reason to be encouraged. Um, we all know investing in nature is a very good deal. Um, it, 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 pays, it pays high returns. And um, the challenge we have is to get more people to see it the way we do. And so the key to unlocking that progress, more than anything else, is the data and evidence and science that the NAPCAP project produces and is producing you know, ever better and at bigger scale and on a faster basis. Uh, the Chinese ex example is a really encouraging one. With NAPCAP data, the partnership, I think, can really help decision makers around the world in government and business understand how investing in nature is such a good deal. That will allow, allow us to scale up our work and, and achieve our goals before it's too late. We are in the race of our lives, so there's no room for complacency. But if we keep our you know, nose to the grindstone and continue to, to, to come up with the data and evidence that can unlock this progress, we sh should be in good shape. So it's great to be here. And thanks, everybody, for supporting NAPCAP. Now, now, now let me introduce Professor Ouyang, Director of Research Center for the Eco-Environmental Sciences, Chinese Academy of Science, as mentioned earlier, NACAP's new official core partner. Thank you. S thanks, Steve. <coughs> We're very happy to be the new partnership of the Net Capital. Actually, the Net Capital project <coughs> from the last 10 years actually worked together and have ch and mainstream ism services and net capital in policy making in the national level and the local level. Actually, today, uh, this, this year, we, we are very happy several local uh, government agencies and joined us. And they like to be the pilot area to be the new mechanism for marketing ism services and net capital and to benefit the local people and poor people. So I believe of the project and the natural capital project will benefit China and the other part of the world. Thank you all of you support the China to come science and support China. Thank you for your, thank you for your leadership. And, and lastly, the organization of which NETCAP is a part, the Woods Center for the Environment, the Woods Institute for the Environment, Chris Field. Thank you, Steve. Well, on behalf of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, it's a special pleasure to welcome you all here tonight and to have a chance to express the pride and excitement that Stanford feels about being one of the core NatCap founders. It's a special pleasure to welcome the newest partner, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. You know, NatCap is, is made of a huge number of, of wonderful, dedicated, creative people uh, but the genuine strength comes from the essence of it being a partnership. Uh, the vision is ambitious, but there are elements of it that no single institution could really uh, in any way be able to capitalize on. And so at least for me, the thing that I really want to help celebrate at this evening's gathering and even more profoundly in the symposium that's going on over the, the three days is the, the essential feature of bringing uh, different interests, different objectives, and different goals uh, to bear in a way that takes advantage of the NatCap tools but really extends them. You know, uh, at least for me, the 
uh, essential features of this partnership, one that brings together now the Chinese Academy of Sciences, WWF, TNC, the University of Minnesota, and Stanford, along with um, dozens of other entities around the world, is that we have the opportunity to advance an agenda that is not only based on ideas we already have, but is going to grow from ideas that are yet to be added. And at least for me, that's the, the spark of what makes NatCap exciting, is the potential to pursue opportunities yet unseen. Thanks so much. Yeah, I think there is no question that the challenges are daunting, but it's the power of the partnership represented by each and every one of you tonight that is going to allow us to overcome and succeed in this major challenge. I also want to thank each of our core partners for their contributions over the past 10 years. As NADCAP has defined and refined its unique capabilities and dimensioned the data, interdisciplinary science, and software to support them. We look forward to working with all of you as we achieve the dramatic scaling necessary to realize our desired impact. Thank you, enjoy your dinner, and you'll hear from Gretchen in a few moments. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I want to repeat the really warm welcome that, that Steve made to all of you. I always get very nervous, um, especially in front of a group like this, so I have wine here and that lets me take you know just one molecule to offset the nervousness and I have to be careful I don't go one molecule too far. <laughs> so take a sip and then you can keep eating but I'll just share some reflections on this wonderful moment we have. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, <laughs> so I have to say, you know, in welcoming you to Stanford, I was reflecting back on when I first got here. And actually, my first day here was one of the worst days of my life. I thought I had made just a terrible mistake. I had grown up uh, mostly overseas on U.S. military bases. And it, I didn't realize that that was an unusual upbringing. And I got here and I just felt, um, you know, I would never fit in into such a refined community as we have around the tables in this incredibly beautiful, just stunning um, venue, the Bing Concert Hall. And um, <clears throat> so I felt really scared and uncomfortable and I was, my mind, can get quite carried away and it was just telling me to get out of here <laughs> as fast as I could but I didn't know how to go back to where I came from I, I couldn't go back <laughs> to the <clears throat> those military bases really but luckily um, by about the third day the president of Stanford at the time Don Kennedy um, convened all the newcomers like myself I was a freshman so about 17 and got us into the biggest hall at the time on campus. And, you know, we're sitting there and I just had bats in my stomach and was wondering um, <clears throat> what to do. And he said, I always will remember this. He said, if you're comfortable, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> and I, I just couldn't believe he said that. And he said, then he said, no one sitting here should feel comfortable. <laughs> and I, <laughs> So I kind of decided to pay attention to what would come next, and I have no memory of what he said <laughs> for the next hour. But it was so reassuring kind of to know that um, it was all right <laughs> to feel as uncomfortable as I was. And the reason I bring this up now is that, <clears throat> as you would have felt a bit in the toast, even as we went around among the five core partner leads, there is a lot of discomfort in the movement, in the quest that we share. It, it's a really hard quest at some levels to be all about averting planetary destruction and intense human suffering. At one level, you know, that's what we wake up to do. And um, <clears throat> if you're looking at that side of it, you know, there's bad news everywhere. 
And um, it's hard taking that in sometimes. It's very scary. There's a ton of uncertainty. The people in this movement work like mad. Everybody I know works like mad, just around the clock, partly with all of that awareness. And yet at the same time, we know that even the most heroic effort you know, might not end up um, taking us to the dream we have, a more positive sounding dream, we could say, you know, harmonizing people and nature, to put it more in the language used in China. So, you know, I came to a place feeling unrefined, a very refined place, and then I, I feel in some ways I chose an unrefined career path. And it's hard even advising students on this career path, because all the other career paths that I see, and maybe it's that I just don't know much about them, but to the left and right of this path look a lot smoother and easier, and um, people don't have to work quite so hard, and um, more secure, easier to go explain to your parents why you're putting all the investment they made in you, you know, into <clears throat> this cockamamie scheme of um, natural capital, for example. But um, if you look at the other side of how we think and how we feel about all this, we can say, you know, whether we regard our situation as hell, you know, or heaven, it's up to us. It's our perception. Whether, um, you know, we're out, we could step back and realize there is no clean, you know, quick, easy fix to the really complex set of issues, challenges that we face. There's nothing that clear, um, and it's rather a situation that we are going to live in our lives, however open we are to um, accepting that reality and, you know, really taking it in day to day. It's a situation we live and to which we can aspire, you know, to bring the very, very best of ourselves in the mission that was stated for the universities and certainly also for the NGO partners. And um, <clears throat> so with that, I felt, you know, at Stanford, I thought after hearing Don Kennedy, I would give it a little time. And <laughs> once giving this NatCap mission a little time, it's amazing how the quest becomes quite addicting. It's amazing how the quest becomes deeply fulfilling. And it's quite amazing to see how the quest actually becomes joyful. It's the weirdest thing, and I want to try to figure that out more. <clears throat> and I'll probably need some more wine to do that than I've had just now. But um, what I'd like to do in talking about how joyful it is to engage in all this together is lay out two dimensions. One is just the vision and the plan. The vision and, and the plan are incredible. They're just so compelling for all the complexity of the situation, for all the uncertainty now and ahead, mainstreaming the values of nature and all that involves in all our thinking, our feeling, and the way we act, the way we codify the right way to act in societies and in different institutions around the world. It is so compelling and satisfying intellectually. And then at the level of feeling, it's amazing at this meeting every year to see, we counted since I gave Steve the, you know, 35 countries, I think there are at least 40 to 45 countries represented here, many different languages, many different technical areas of background, many different career stages, people in all kinds of paths of life, um, many different cultures, there's such nuance in the different ways we see and live life. And we're all coming together to share and drive forward in this quest. And it, it might sound soft or you know weak, um, but I find that feeling that we get you know, in every day, thinking about how we can work ever more powerfully together, just completely absorbing and completely, um, I don't know, it, it just ignites this power. I feel that we can magnify together and, and see ignited in places all around the world. So what I'd like to do, it's really ignited in China now. 
And <clears throat> I would like to now say more specifically what this quest is about, reflecting on China and on the performance that we'll see after dinner. Um, so it's incredible. I'll first illustrate just like the vision and plan and the way they're being implemented in China through the leadership of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, a big part of the government, many different um, levels, the NDRC, the National Development and Reform Commission, and then here among us, guests um, distributed among tables and speaking more in Chinese at that table of greatest honor there in the center of the room are people in places that today, right now, are implementing this vision. And um, the idea has caught fire at every level. So Xi Jinping is famous now in China for saying something loosely translated to English as lush mountains and clear waters are gold and silver. We will not trade them for gold or silver. And that's sort of looking back at all of the focus on GDP growth for the past several decades and the cost associated with that. And looking forward and saying, we're going to make a whole different system here. And the system, it's, it's complex. So I don't mean to oversimplify it here, but given um, our time and the moment, I'll just say really briefly what the pieces are. So one piece is just shining a light on these intimate connections between people and nature. And then expressing that connection, those many different connections, in value terms, in meaningful ways, to open up a pathway for green and inclusive growth. So everything, that inclusive part is essential. Everything is about poverty alleviation and social equity and about the green. So elevating the well-being of people and securing the environment at the same time. Green growth, national security, it's at that level. And <clears throat> once shining a light, then it's about talking about it, talking about what you see and feel with that light, developing a common language that becomes standardized. And the Chinese are amazing in that, with the written language established over, you know, going so far back to unify the country at the time of the first dynasty in China's history. So it's spoken in many different ways, but there's that unifying language across the entire culture. And then what Ouyang and others have developed is a system of accounting. You have to have that for ecological performance. So we have all these systems of accounting for economic performance and for, say, other types of performance, but there was nothing. And now <clears throat> there's been established this China ecosystem assessment. Every five years, there's sort of ongoing accounting and reporting every five years on how natural capital is doing. And they just announced only a couple weeks ago that they're doing this actually across the whole Silk Road, the new Silk Road, the Belt and Road Initiative. They call this the digital Silk Road. So using a lot of this system of accounts is based on satellite imagery and other remote sensing. They're doing this across the entire you know, modern day and, and future dream of the, the Silk Road to come. Um, and then related to that, in using Invest, which we've co-developed over these many years and refined in many ways using the incredible um, data and ability to sort of road test all the models in China, um, estimating the flow of benefits to people, that whole side of it. And um, then, so that's, that's say one huge piece, the system of accounts and the flow of benefits. The second big piece represented by the most honorable people who have joined us tonight is bringing that into policy, finance, and management. And they've, as you know, reading the paper day by day, there's massive restructuring of the government, all of it really empowering the environmental side of things to bring in to policy, finance, and management this information on ecological performance. And using that, I'll just give one example of what's happening. They've zoned the country 
It's called redlining. You might have, have read about that. And in these zones, I'll mention that the natural capital focused zone spans 49% of the entire country, is prioritized for investments in natural capital to deliver these benefits for this dream. The, you know, Xi Jinping puts it in terms of China's dream, becoming the ecological civilization of the 21st century. And this is happening. The, the last um, related to that zoning is investment. So um, I'll, I'll mention one last thing. It, it's way more complex than this, but the last thing is they're developing a new metric to help guide investment. It's called GEP. It's going to be reported right alongside GDP, gross domestic product, it stands for gross ecosystem product. And the whole system is pretty much there and ready to go. GEP is now being road tested. Part of our symposium this week is focused on kind of the final details and getting that metric right. It will illuminate, you know, the contribution of ecosystems to society. It'll show the ecological connections among regions in China and show what financial flows ought to be happening in this green growth model. So who's supplying these ecosystem benefits, what landholders and others are there supplying, and who benefits, and how can we compensate in a way that maintains supply and brings awareness to where all that life support is coming from. And then finally, it's going to be used as a performance uh, metric for government officials, partly not to penalize people doing a fantastic job in securing the environment and yet not getting much credit for it because they don't have 20% GDP growth or something. Um, but all that financial compensation today is already paying about 200 million people every year, every day, for ecosystem conservation and restoration for benefits to society so, and for securing the country. And all of this really can extend across the world. So many of the other countries represented here are here to learn from China and see all the things that they've managed to get right, even coming out of a pretty desperate time that would get my spirit down, you know, thinking about some of the days we're in Beijing when you can't see your hand in front of you, but really lifting out of that time and moving into um, a very inspiring transformation. So even the city of London, I was sent a couple days ago, has developed a natural capital account reporting on the total value of the green space in London, the value of those assets, and annually an eight billion pound stream of benefits to people living and working in London. So from all this, those are some of the details on China, on the vision and the plan. But from it comes such a powerful feeling. And I think it's over many years, as Professor Ouyang mentioned, that we've been working together, deepening our understanding, just feeling the compassion in all of the work. We've been taken by Professor Ouyang to every corner of China, to the richest cities, and out to you know, the poorest areas where people haven't heard of electricity, much less experienced it. Um, the amount of trust, the courage, the dedication, and the admiration that you feel working there or working in any of the many countries with individuals like these here and here together in the room with all of us, just the exhilaration and the beauty in, in what we can do if we are all kind of activated and sharing in this feeling. So it's a deepest and best human experience, really. I'm glad I stayed at least this long here at Stanford. And um, I want to thank you very, very much and um, raise a toast. And some of the wine here is thanks to yet another wonderful activated person, John Miller, and his vineyard in Oregon. Let's enjoy the evening together. Cheers. Oh, OK. Cheers again. And uh, Mary might come up here if, if anybody wants to throw us some easy questions, because now we've had a bit too many molecules, probably, for a hard question. 
we can just have a brief exchange and then we're going to, the, the performance will be explained to us. But you know, the performers have come all the way from China and their performance will embody basically this flame of um, working toward harmony between people and nature going back a long, long time. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm really yeah. The lights are amazing. And if you don't want to ask a question, that's fine with us. <laughs> What if we just enjoy the evening? Yeah. How about that? That sounds that? great. <laughs> that sounds great.